Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about section uh, 11.3, where we're going to be talking about probability. So in section 3 here, uh, we're going to be talking about three different types of probabilities, but we're going to start first with some definitions. Um, so the first defi definition, the possible results of an action we refer to as outcomes. For example, your action might be rolling a six-sided die. If you do that, there are six possible outcomes. You roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. A six-sided die is your normal like board game die. And die is just the single, singular of dice. Uh, we refer to an event as a single outcome or collection of outcomes. So for example, Rolling a six-sided die, there's our action, and getting an odd number is an event. So the event of getting an odd number contains three outcomes. You could roll a, a one, a three, or a five. However, an event could just be a single outcome. Uh, so another example, let's say we roll a six-sided die and we get the and and we're looking at getting a four. That's an event, rolling a four, and it contains only one outcome, rolling the four. There's only one way to get a four. So we define a probability, which we often denote with the letter P, of an event is a number from zero to one that indicates the likelihood that an event will occur. So when we write probabilities, we usually write those as fractions or decimals or percentages, any of those three ways of representing your probability would be fine. Um, keep in mind though that the probability has to be a number between zero and one. So if you write down an answer where the probability isn't in between that two range, that is gonna be automatically zero credit for me. If you write down an answer that is an impossible result, you can never have a probability that's negative. You can't have a probability that's bigger than one. If you write down an answer that is one of those things, it's zero credit. It is a nonsense answer. Okay? So if you make a mistake and that ends up being your answer, at minimum, you need to write down afterwards, like, I know there's a mistake here. I couldn't find it. I know this is a nonsense answer. At least admit to me that you know you're writing down a nonsense answer. But I'm going to be quite picky about this. You need to represent a probability as a number between 0 and 1. So like 0.5 or 3 sevenths or 86%. All of those are reasonable response, um, probabilities. Negative 5, not reasonable. Probability of 5 not reasonable. Probability of 5% is okay. Because remember, what decimal does 5% represent? Well, it's 5 divided by 100, or 0.05. Those are all okay. Can't have numbers that are bigger than 1 and less than 0. Okay. Uh, the kind of probability we'll spend the most time talking about in this class is called a theoretical probability. So when all events are equally likely, and that's really important. So an example where the events are not equally likely, or an example of events, or where, I'm sorry, an example of a situation where all outcomes are equally likely, it's like rolling your die, right? You have an equal chance of rolling a 1 as you do rolling a 6. There, it's, all, it's all the same. Situation where it's not equally likely, um, you know, could be if you're rolling two dice. So if you roll two dice, the probability of getting a 7 is much greater than the probability of rolling a 2, right? If you think about that for a moment, there's lots of ways to get a seven. You could get six and one, five and two, and three and four, but there's only one way to get a two. You have to roll a one and a one. So 
We have to approach those sorts of situations a little bit more, a little bit differently. Um, but the theoretical probability of an event here, again, when all outcomes are equally likely, is the number of outcomes in event A divided by the total number of outcomes. And oftentimes when we refer to these theoretical probabilities, we're just going to call it a probability. We'll just drop that term theoretical. So let's look at some examples of calculating um, some theoretical probabilities here. So let's say we just have a we're just rolling a six-sided die. I don't know why I wrote it twice. And the first example is the probability of um, rolling a five. Well, that's going to be the number of ways I'll use that hashtag symbol as abbreviation for number over total number of outcomes. Okay, so there's only one way to roll a five when we're rolling a dice, and, or rolling a die, and it's just to get a five, right? To roll a dice and get a, there's only six things that can happen. You can roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. The only way to roll exactly five is to roll a five. There's just one way to do that. The total number of outcomes, well, there's six of those. You could roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. So our probability here, we could write as one-sixth. You could convert that into a decimal if you wanted, or you could convert that into a percentage if you wanted, but I don't know why we would bother since we uh, already have it written as a fraction there. What about we want the probability of rolling an even number? Okay, so that's going to be the number of ways to roll an even over the total number of outcomes. Well, how many different ways are there to roll an even? Well, you could roll a two, that's an even number. You could roll a four, that's an even number. Or you could roll a six, that's an even number. So there's three rolls that are even, and just like before, we said there were six possible outcomes. You could roll a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So the probability there would be 1 half. Um, let's look at a situation now that's a little bit more complicated. Oh, hold on. Uh, so let's look at this situation. This is a little bit more complicated, um, but just kind of super, superficially complicated. It's really not much more difficult than what we had just done. So uh, the situation is that there's a talent show being held with seven contestants performing, and the order in which the contestants perform is going to be randomly selected. Uh, what this randomly selected is telling us is that all outcomes are equally likely. So we, can, we know that we can use our theoretical probability formula without having to make any adjustments there. That's what randomly selected is going to give us. Uh, so the first thing we're going to ask is, what is the probability that the contestants perform in alphabetical order? That is assuming that no two contestants have the same name, meaning that there's just one order that's alphabetical, right? Now, at first glance, you might think that you'd have to know the names of the contestants, right? But it doesn't really matter. So our theoretical probability 
is the number of alphabetical orders over the total number of orders. So if we want to alphabetize something and each item in our list has its set own different label, right? Because again, we know that no two contestants have the same name. There's exactly one way to do that. There's only one way to do an alphabetical order. That's why oftentimes when we sort things, we like to sort them in alphabetical order because there's just one way to do that. So that was easy, easy counting. To count the total number of orders now, we have to think about this for a moment, but this is a question that we've asked before, right? So if we think about this situation, we have seven um, places where this performer or the contestants could perform. And we have seven performers to put in those spots. So how many people could perform would we have to choose to go first? Well, there's seven contestants, so we'd have seven choices how to, of who goes first. How many choices would we have to see who goes second? Well, there's only six left because we picked somebody already to go first. So there's six choices then for who would go second. For who goes third, well, we've already picked one to go first and one to go second. So there's five left to go third. And then I think from this point, you guys can see where we're going. So that product is going to be the total number of orders possible. So it's, and we have a name for that kind of multiplication. We call that seven factorial. And if you remember, there's a way to do that on our calculator where we don't have to type it all in. So if I press the seven and then I go math button, over to the probability menu, and then select the exclamation point. I get that seven factorial is 5,040. So we have then our probability is one over 5,040. Again, you could write that as a decimal or a percentage, but boy, that fraction is pretty nice and clean looking there, right? Um, the next one is a little bit um, trickier because we're not talking about uh, really the entire order anymore. So, again, are we're looking at the probability that the first two are friends. So we want the number of orders where the first two are your friends. So if you read this carefully, we're not talking about the entire lineup here. We're only concerned with the first two performers or the first two contestants. Um, so the number of orders where, you're where the first two performers are your friends, well, this sounds like one of the counting problems that we just talked about previously. It sounds a little like a combination or permutation question. Okay. 
can we make a decision as to whether this we should be using a combination or permutation to count this? Well, if you think about this for a moment, say that we have friend A first and then friend B second. Is that the same as having friend B first and then friend A second in terms of this kind of a situation? Are the first two contestants your friends here? Yes. Are the first two contestants your friends there? Yes. So would those be the same outcome? Yes. So if order of the events does not matter, we use the combination to do this. So we're going to be using a combination here. So how many friends do we have to choose from? We have four friends to choose from. And we're going to be using a combination. And how many do we need to choose? Two of them. And now for the first two performers, the total number of ways, well, we have seven total contestants to choose from. And we need to pick two of them. So we can do this on our calculator. So I'm going to type a four. I'm going to do the top first. And I'm going to press the math button, go over to the PRB tab, and select the NCR command. So I'll do four, NCR two. So there's six ways to do that. And then rather than going back through all those menus, I'm going to press second and enter. And then just go back and edit that four into a seven. So we have six out of 21, or you notice that that reduces to um, uh, two out of seven. Okay, with that, so that was a little bit trickier, right? Because we had to use those combinations and permutations. Um, well, actually, we didn't use any permutations, but we had to decide whether we're going to use a combination or permutation there. So it was a little bit tricky. Uh, let's look at one more example. Uh, this next example says we have an equally likely chance of choosing any integer from 1 through 20. Again, notice that we have equally likely. We need that for our theoretical probability formula. So each outcome has to be equally um, likely, which we have. Next thing we should just review here real quickly is this term integer. So again, remember an integer is a whole number, positive, negative, or zero. So the integers from 1 to 20 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Okay, so the probability of choosing a perfect square is going to be the number of perfect squares over um, the total number of integers. Well, we should probably reflect on what we mean by a perfect square. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, so a perfect square is a number like 4, because 4 is equal to 2 squared. So how many perfect squares are there? Well. There's one before four, that's one. And there's gonna be several after four. So three squared is nine, four squared is 16, five squared is 25, but that's too big now. 
So we don't want that one. So there's exactly four numbers that are perfect squares that are in between um, 1 and 20. They are 1, 4, 9, and 16. Those are our four perfect squares. And then the total number of integers from 1 to 20, well, there's just 20 of them. So that reduces down to 1 fifth. Okay. Um, next thing, what's the probability of choosing a factor of 30? Well, again, we should talk about what we mean by a factor of 30. So an example of a factor of 30 might be 1, because 30 divided by 1 has a 0 remainder. So what are some other factors of 30? Well. 2, because 30 divided by 2 is 15, that has no remainder. There's 3, because 30 divided by 3 is 10, that had no remainder. 4 is not a factor, because 4 divided by 30 has remainder 2. Uh, 5 is a factor, because 5, or 30 divided by 5 is 6. 6 is also a factor, because 30 divided by 6 is 5. 7 is not a factor because 30 divided by 7 has remainder 2. 8 is not a factor because 8 divided by, or 30 divided by 8 has remainder 6. 9 is not a factor, it has remainder 3. 10 is though because 30 divided by 10 is 3, and 15 is also, because 30 divided by 15 is 2, and the last one is 30 itself, because 30 divided by 30 is 1. So if I count those up, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 factors of 30. However, I don't want 30. Why not? Because I'm only interested in the numbers that are between 1 and 20. So 30 is too big. It's not a possible draw. So I really have just seven of these. So the number of factors over the total number of integers, which again is still 20. So that one is just 7 over 20. Okay. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about another kind of probability called experimental probability. So our next definition is going to be for something called experimental probability. So sometimes um, the probability of an event is not obvious. Um, so often what we'll do in those sorts of situations is do an experiment with a large number of um, participants and use that information to calculate a probability that approximates the real probability for such an event. This is especially common when you're looking at like how individuals might you know, like people's opinions on things. Um, so the experimental probability, the way we calculate that, is the probability that event A occurs is equal to the number of trials where event A occurs divided by the total number of trials. And that might sound a little confusing, but we'll do an example here and you'll see that it's actually um, quite easy so in this example, the bar graph shows how old adults in a survey would choose to be if they could choose any age. So 463 would prefer to be under 20, 1085 
from 20 to 29, 879 from um, 30, would prefer 30 to 39, et cetera. You can read the rest of these. So our question is, what is the probability that a randomly selected adult would prefer to be at least 40? Okay. So the first thing we'd want to do is we're going to identify um, which of these outcomes in our experiment indicate a preference to be at least 40. So when we say at least 40, that means older than 40. So we have three outcomes in our experiment that would indicate a preference to be at least 40. So at least is the same as greater than or equal to. So I'm just going to write the greater than or equal symbol. You could write at least 50. So that's going to be the same as the probability from 40 to 49 plus the probability from 50 to 59 plus the probability from 60 to 69. Since each one of these represent a um, situation where the preference is to be at least 40. So here we have 551 out of the total, which we haven't calculated yet, but then we have 300 out of the total, again, which we haven't calculated yet, plus 238 out of the total, which we haven't calculated yet. So the total number of participants in our survey It's just going to be the sum here. So if I added those up, I get uh, 3,516. And since these all have a common denominator, I can add all three of these up. When I do that, I get um, 1,089 over 3,516. So again, why am I adding up several probabilities here? Because there's several probabilities that indicate a pref age preference to be at least 40. So at least 40 could be any one of these three outcomes. So our event A of being at least 40 contained three outcomes. So I just took the sum of those three probabilities. Okay, so that's kind of what we do with an experimental probability. All you're probably going to be doing is adding up some things it'll be pretty easy to figure out, um, given your survey, the number of um, events that incur, or a number of uh, outcomes that occur for a given event, because you'll just, you'll be given the data in front of you. And the total number of outcomes is usually really easy because you'll have the total number of responses in your data. So it should be easy to kind of calculate something like that. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, the last type of probability, is geometric probability. So let's define that. So the last top of geometric probability is calculated by comparing the ratio of two lengths, areas, or volumes. So uh, we're going to look at an example here. So you throw a dart at a square board as shown. Your dart is equally likely to hit any point inside the board. Are you more likely to score 10 points or 0 points? So the 10-point area, you'll see, is the center yellow area. And the 0-point areas, you'll see, are these grays in the corner, where you're not really on the bullseye at all. Okay, so the probability of getting a 10 is going to be the 
yellow circle. Actually, we should say the area of the yellow circle, because landing anywhere in there would be OK, divided by the entire board. And the probability of getting a 0 is going to be the area of the gray corners. divided by the area of the entire board. Um, and maybe I should put the word area on here. OK. Well, I have to recall a little bit of geometry now. So the area of the yellow circle, well, the area of a circle is pi r squared. And in this case, we know the radius is 3. And the entire area for the entire board is going to be the area of this square. Well, how can I calculate the area of that square? I don't know any of the side lengths. Remember, the area of the square is going to be side length squared. But we really do, right? Because I know that this segment here and this segment here have to be the same length, right? So if this piece is 3, this piece has to be 3. And if this piece is 3, this piece is 3. If this piece is 3, this piece is 3. So the whole thing is 18. So it's going to be 18 squared. So if I go to my calculator then, and I'm going to use my calculator here to get a decimal instead of leaving it as a fraction because the pi in there. So I'll do alpha y equals, and then I'm going to pick the numerator over denominator. Do second and the caret sign to get the pi symbol times 3 squared divided by 18 squared. So that should be about uh, 0 0.0873. Or you could call that 8.73% if you wanted to. Either one is okay. Now let's get the gray corners. So those gray corners aren't a real shape that we're familiar with, right? Those aren't exactly triangles because the side is curved. So what I'm going to do here for the area of the gray corners is I'm going to do the area of the square. And then I'm going to minus out the area of the blue circle. And we know that, again, the area of the square is 18 squared. And the area of this blue circle, well, the blue circle has radius 3, 6, 9. So there's that. So let's do this again. Alpha y equals. We're going to have 18 squared minus pi times 9 squared over 18 squared. And there I get about 21 or point uh, 215 per about sorry 0.215 or 21.5 percent. Again, either way of representing it is okay. Um, so which one is more likely? The bigger probability is more likely. So getting zero points is more likely. Which again, if you're used to playing darts, should be the case, right? The bullseye should be harder to get than the zero scores. Um, what part of this makes it kind of a uh, 
unrealistic model if you're talking about actual dart players. Well, it's the assumption that your dart is equally likely to hit any point. If you're aiming, you think that you'd be more likely to get here towards the center than you would here at the corners, right? But for our purposes of making this problem doable, we're going to assume equally likely. If you wanted to do something differently, this becomes a much more complicated problem and kind of beyond the scope of what I would ask you guys to do in this kind of a class. Okay, uh, that should do it. So you should now be able to, uh, be able to do homework three. Uh, good luck.